You're listening to the Common Descent Podcast. Hey, Will. Hello, David. Hello, listeners. Hi, guys. Our dear audience. This is Common Descent Podcast, episode 18. Welcome back, and thank you for joining us. How's everybody doing? How are you, listeners? What's new in your life? Good. I'm glad to hear it. Yeah. Oh, no. It's, it's always great to hear from you. Yeah. No. Keep it up. <laughs> we are good, too. 18 episodes into the podcast. How cool is that, by the way? I know, right? Good stuff. Today's episode is a very interesting topic, a requested topic. This mm -hmm. topic comes to us from Mac, who made the request on our blog, actually. Uh, yeah. I think this is the the first request that we ever got on the in, in, in the actual blog, as opposed to Facebook, Twitter. We get requests from all different sources, which is really, really cool. Thanks for proving that people read the blog, Mac. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, thanks for reading our blog. <laughs> it's funny, because we don't we get lots of feedback on the podcast, but we don't really get much feedback on the blog, mm -hmm. so it's hard to gauge the popularity of it. Yes, this is true. I know some people are reading it. That we're, we're gonna, we're, that doesn't mean we're ever going to stop doing it, so... Nope, probably not. That's going to be a thing that happens. It's just going to keep going. So today's episode is human evolution. Yeah. Which is a heck of a topic. It's, it's definitely... It's got a lot to it, scientifically, and arguably even more socially. It sure does. Mm -hmm. Now, human evolution, the topic of human evolution put us in a, a strange position mm -hmm. because there's so much. This is this is an insane field. It really like, is. It's got its own name. Mm -hmm. Right? Paleoanthropology, specifically the study of human evolution. There are multiple scientific journals devoted just to this topic. A, a lot of science news sites will have sections specifically for yes tabs that you can go to specifically for just human evolution news so this episode we're putting together the ideas for this episode and, and realize that we there's so much to talk about mm -hmm. but we want to do it all justice there's always so much right we always say yes this episode this topic could be a whole podcast of its own which incidentally this this particular topic is its own podcast yes <laughs> <laughs> it's called Origin Stories. It's put together by the Leaky Foundation, and everybody should listen to it because it's fantastic. <laughs> but that put us in an odd position of having to figure out, you know, where do we focus? Uh, you know, what do we leave out, basically? Yeah, how do you condense something this big? E exactly. How do you condense something like this into one episode? And we decided we won't. Yeah. Dear listeners, this is episode 18, part one. Uh -huh. We are going to split this discussion into two episodes, starting at the beginning of the evolution of our ancestors. But before we get into that, before we start talking about that, yes. uh, let's make it through the news. Yeah. Because there's a lot to talk about after the news. So let's start with some news, starting with over to the ancient oceans desk with Will. Will? Hey, that's me. I do have lots of stuff on Ancient Oceans, both my news articles. There's just cool stuff to be found. The first one, though, is... It's, it's, oh, this is one of the more interesting ones I've gotten to talk about on our podcast. I, I really like what happened with this. Cool. So Do tell. My first news article is about how plesiosaurs were able to swim with four flippers. Very cool. And so plesiosaurs, of course, are the famous... Uh, aquatic reptiles that really, really kicked butt during the age of reptiles. Uh, you know, Mesozoic, yeah. these are the long-necked ones. You also have the long-jawed, like Leoplorodon and all of those. Mm -hmm. And they're really, really famous and well-known. They've been being researched for uh, the better part of a century. Oh, yeah. Didn't Mary Anning discover? Yes. I think the first plesiosaurs were her? Maybe. Mm -hmm. yeah, don't quote me on that. At, at, at least some of the first most famous ones. I don't know if they... Yeah, yeah. But they've been around for a long time, but one of the biggest mysteries about them is one of the things that would seem 
to have been able to be answered by now, but it's how they swam. Interesting. And the reason this is such a mystery is that they have four fully developed flippers on their body. You know, where their limbs would be are four giant paddles Mm -hmm. that are all identical to one another. And this seems to make sense if you want to swim, flippers help. But it's weird because there are no other vertebrates that we know of, especially no modern ones, that have this design. True. All other flipper swimming animals that we have today, like seals or penguins and sea turtles, those are the three they look at in the study for how they swim, all Mm -hmm. use their front flipper. And even turtles who have four four flippers only use the back two as rudders. Interesting. So plesiosaurs are using all, they have highly developed all four. And so it's it's like how do you how are they using these flippers in propulsion when the back ones are designed exactly like the front ones? Uh, interesting. So it's it's you know a a very interesting question and really the the main point the main you know debate or two options that have been going for these flippers is that were they swimming together as in as one goes up one pair goes up the other pair also goes up and then both mm-hmm. go down, and then both go back up? Or were they alternating? Fronts go down while the back go up, and then vice, you know, they flip so that they right. one is going up while the other is going down. And a in a research paper published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society B uh, by Luke E. Muscat et al., they tested it by making a robot. Please, you saw a robot. Yeah! Now, it's not as cool. I was very much hoping, because there's a video that will go along with it, and we'll post that in the blog. But uh, yeah. it's not like a full robot. It's No, it's not. Flippers. <laughs> it, it rarely is. It's flippers <laughs> on, on gauges that can be controlled in their movement and lowered into water. Yeah, you got to start somewhere. Yeah, you have to... Well, that, it's, it's, it's half of a robot. They just have to make it so that it's mobile. Yes. <laughs> Then we can have the Scooby Doo movie where guy some guy drives it as he's making the Loch Ness monster go around. Yeah. This robot was really cool. So they put three D printed flippers based off of the fossils mm-hmm. onto two separate motor servos that they could alternate their flapping. And they just did a very simple up down flapping motion. You know, they were talking about exactly what motion the flippers will you know made could be research for another study. As to if it's a figure eight like a penguin right. or, you know, flying birds or is it just a circle or up and down or they were just trying to figure out how did the flow of one affect the other. Right. So they put them in the water. They have dye extruding, red and blue dye coming out from each flipper so they can see the water flow. And then they cool. put them through a whole bunch of different uh, uh, flapping patterns. Yeah. And it's really cool. The video has some really great visuals. The, there's pictures that go along with the article showing the movement of the ink. That's really amazing. And like I said, the question was, do they go together like a fly's wings where both pairs are going up and down or like a dragonfly's where they alternate? And what they found is, now they can only determine efficiency with this test, but they found the most efficient form of flapping was when they go together. With the back one following just behind the front. And the reason for that is as the front one flaps, it creates these currents with each upward and downward motion. Mm -hmm. And when they alternated, the back one would catch those currents. But by following behind it fairly closely, it dodges between those currents and is able to increase the propulsion much more. Cool. In the video, I think the the researcher makes the comment that the back flippers are catching the wake of the front flippers. Yes. So the plesiosaur is drifting itself. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And the cool thing that the news article made a point of is it's, you know, using the, own, the wake that it makes. And the only other creature that's known to do that is the dragonfly with its wings. Oh, interesting. And so dragonfly is doing a similar thing. Where the but the wings are able to move separately, but they're using the currents from one to increase the efficiency of the of the other. Very very cool. So yeah, it's it's a cool thing. It's a very technical, you know, way to study fossil behavior, which I am always interested when we're, uh, you know, crossing the professions between robotics and paleontology. Absolutely. So yeah. Very nice. Speaking of creatures with wings, so my first news article 
that I have brought with us today is about dodos. Dodos? Dodos are an interesting species because they're super famous, Mm -hmm. but we don't know very much about them. Yes. Uh, And the more that we research dodos, the more we're revealing intricacies in their their life history and their, their behavior and their evolution. And this is a study that was performed by Angst et al. 2017 in the journal Scientific Reports, uh, which I think is through Nature, which looked at bone histology of dodos. So they took 22 bones, sliced them into super tiny, thin sections, put them under the microscope, and looked at the signs of bone growth within the bones. Mm Mm-hmm. This is something that's actually really common. We do this with lots of different animals. And in this case, what it allowed them to do was look at the yearly life history of dodo, something that we don't really know very much about, which is interesting considering that this is a species we have historical reports of. That's the weirdest thing is that dodos have this huge mystery around them, but we have people's written letters of their accounts with these animals. Yeah. Like, yep. it's it's weird for us to know so little about something that we, we helped make extinct. Yes. <laughs> yes, it is. So we're learning in this... So so in this study, one of the things you we're all, you always hear about when you look and learn about histology studies, that is bone histology, looking at how bones grow, is this feature called lines of arrested growth. And that is, if you think of a tree ring... The reason trees have rings is because they grow really well during the summer Mm -hmm. or during part of the year, and then their growth slows down or stops. And so in the, in in the harsher seasons. So when you look at those rings, you're seeing, what you're seeing is fast growth, reduced growth, fast growth, reduced growth. (laughs) Bones do the same thing. Yeah. So you can look at reptiles. Yep. Reptiles, birds, you can see these growth lines. And in the case of dodos, what they're what they're interpreting is that the slowdown of growth is what's happening because they're in tropical islands. This mm-hmm. is Mauritius. What's happening is that the slow growth is occurring during the intense cyclone season of November through March, because that's a time where it's really hard to get food. Conditions are really tough. And that's the time where their growth is essentially slowing down to reset once the fall starts. Yeah. And this allowed them to pinpoint the times during the year that other things are happening. So, for example, they found the buildup of medullary bone in some of these specimens. And medullary bone is what forms in females preparing to lay eggs. Yes. And because the medullary bone signatures were halfway between the lines, they inferred that the breeding season is about six months Mm -hmm. into their year, around August. Cool. From that, they inferred that the chicks would grow rapidly so that they could withstand the next cyclone season. Mm -hmm. And then they also looked for evidence of... One thing that we see in birds is you'll see in the, in the, the bone growth that the bone gets resorbed. Yes. Right? Reabsorbed into the system. And so when you look at their bones, you'll see these missing, this mineral loss. And that happens when they're molting. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As they're resorbing energy for, for feather regrowth. And they saw that happening in between the cyclone season and the breeding season. Interesting. Which is really cool for two reasons. One, it's the same pattern we see in all birds that live on Mauritius today. Mm -hmm. So it fits with other birds' ecology. And this helps to explain why historical accounts of the dodo report them having all sorts of different feather coverings. Yes. Different historical reports say different colors, different amounts of feathers... And one of the articles specifically pointed out the link between uh, reports of dodos with downy feathers in June and July, which fits because that should be after molting had finished as Mm -hmm. they're getting ready for the breeding season. Yeah. 
So this histological study offers us these surprisingly detailed glimpses into what these birds were doing at different parts of the year. Which is really cool. Like it's it's a it's a very, you know a a very close look at like the fact that we're getting down to what's happening almost month to month is yeah insane. Yeah, and it helps in this case that not only are these very recent animals, but the island that they lived on is still here. So yes. we know what the climatic variation yeah, is to like. The exact thing, and yeah. really see, you know, what does July look like? Okay, what does August look like? And know the conditions the animals were dealing with. Yeah, and understanding their life history helps us to gain presumably will help us to get more insight into the most famous thing that these birds ever did, which is uh, go extinct yep. due to human activity. Yep. Yeah, the, the dodos get written off as these, like, you know, it's the same way a lot of books will talk about that because the dinosaurs, or make it seem like because the dinosaurs went extinct, that they failed at survival, which right. is not really the way to look at it, you know. No. Anything can be caused to go extinct if the right circumstances provided. Yes. And dodos get treated the same way. You know, all you have to do is watch the original Ice Age movie. The last Malin. And it's the whole thing is that they're these dumb, idiotic animals. Yep. Which, what, it's that's that's not, you know, we went in to a place where there were no large predators and did a very efficient job <laughs> at wiping yeah. them out. <laughs> like, well, I think they get that reputation because of reports saying that people would go to the the islands and these big fat birds would walk right up to them. Yeah, where they could easily kill them. Mm -hmm. But calling a dodo on an on uninhabited by humans island stupid for walking up to humans is like calling a baby stupid for touching a hot stove. Yes, it's like it's not stupid. They just didn't know any better, and then they all died. Yeah. Like, it's not, they weren't stupid. We're, we're, the people were just really uh, exploitative. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's you know, not for the same reasons. It's domestication in this case, but the ducks that are in the pond in my backyard walk up to people because they hope they're going to get food. Yeah. You know, that was going to be my backup food if I was locked inside, if I was <laughs> separated from society due to Irma. I was <laughs> just going to go walk out there with ducks. my hand out flat and then grab them. <laughs> so, I mean, it's like, if an animal doesn't know to be afraid of you, that doesn't make it stupid. That just means it hasn't learned that fear for some reason. Absolutely. And it's it's a testament to the selective pressure that humans have put on the environment that just about all animals in the world today now know better. Yep. <laughs> Which is a terrifying subject for another discussion. Yes. Yes, it is. So... My next news article is going back into the water, and it is talking about whales. Whales! Uh, whales! Uh, I I, you may have seen an article a little while back talking about uh, that some ancient whales may have been sieving food with their teeth. Yes, that was cor Coronadon. Yes. They had these multi-cusped teeth. They kind of looked like... Uh, a comb-ish. They mm -hmm. had all of these different points on one tooth. And the reason they thought this is there are modern aquatic mammals that use teeth like this. Uh, Crab-eating seals and even leopard seals will mm -hmm. have these multi-pointed teeth. The crab-eating seal, it's really extreme. And the teeth fit together, and there's all these little holes that get created by the multiple bumps on the teeth. And it allows them to take big gulps of water of small krill, which is what crab eaters actually go after, and then mm -hmm. they push the water out, just like whales with baleen would do. Interesting. And the idea was that these sieving teeth might have been part of the transition toward eventually baleen-assisted and then fully baleen filter feeding. Interesting. So these multi-cusp teeth were a transition between mm -hmm. ancient predatory whales and more recent... Filter feeding. Whales. Exactly. You know, not that the teeth became the baleen, but that they started the feeding behavior. Interesting. This article is saying, nah, they didn't do that. Yes. This news article, which is over 
uh, research that was published in Biology Letters by Dr. Alistair Evans. Mm-hmm. They looked at, uh, he and his colleagues looked at the teeth of these whales and multiple other fossil whales, as well as aquatic predators today and land predators. Right. And these included crab eater and leopard seal, uh, things like lions and dingoes and a few other predators, as well as a selection of fossil whales. They, they selected a, a pretty wide variety of animals uh, of different lineages. Hmm. And they looked at the back teeth, the what they call the post-canine teeth. So these are not the front section. It's those back molars and premolars mm-hmm. that if you were to look in your dog's mouth are the ones that's doing all the crunching and all the cats doing all the cutting. Yes. When you look at those teeth, they looked at the cross sections of different positions, uh, the upper section and the points of different cusps. Mm -hmm. And they would look at the cross section to see how round versus uh, how if it uh, whether or not it forms edges. Right. And they statistically were analyzing Mm -hmm. the shapes. Right. And so this is this is a common use in paleontology where we look at we, we reduce the shape of something down to something a computer can analyze, either with yes. putting points on it or making shapes by doing cross sections or what have you, because we have to somehow translate it for the computer to then do statistical analysis with. Okay. Geometric morphometrics. Yes. And it's fantastic, because what we can mm-hmm. then do is we put in all the data and the computer will say, based on what you've told me, now we could always end up giving it bad data by accident, so the yeah. computer's not... <laughs> doing the science, but it says, based on what you give me, this one's most like that one, or these few. And when they did that, they found that the whale teeth shared more in common with terrestrial predators than the aquatic ones that we were looking at. Interesting. So more chomping things more than cutting, eating things. More cutting, meat-eating teeth than sieving ones. Interesting. And so it's likely that most of these fossil whales were active predators of potentially larger prey because mm-hmm. they had these cutting teeth. You don't need cutting teeth when you're eating things you can swallow. You need cutting teeth when you're having to take bites out of stuff. Interesting. So then filter feeding would have come about another way. Another way. And so that's it. there's still you know questions as to exactly how that came in, but they were saying it was it could very well have been after the loss of teeth, you know, but it definitely right, did right. not come due to these kinds of teeth. I think the alternative hypothesis that's been proposed is that it started out as suction feeding, Mm -hmm. which is what walruses do. Yeah, and there's a toothless dolphin cousin that was another news article I had considered doing in place Mm -hmm. of this one that they believe may have been feeding like a walrus. Uh, Interesting. Yeah, if you've never seen how walruses feed, because they don't really have much in the way of teeth outside of their tusks, they go along the bottom, they go, (laughs) and they suck up. Uh, if you decide to things. Google that on YouTube, be careful because putting in wal- walrus suction anything brings up some very particular videos. Uh, <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> Cause, be careful out there on the internet. People. Yeah, because walruses in zoos get lonely and they use that ability in other ways. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was wondering where you were going with that one. But yes, that is a very good question. They, point. I did not... It's really hard to look up walrus suction feeding while like, being like, I heard you say walrus suck. And then that's the first video that comes up. <laughs> Boy, talk about another episode. <laughs> I actually have a book about stuff like that. <laughs> and on that note... <laughs> it's under his mattress. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I read it before I go to sleep. <laughs> it's, don't, don't tell my mom. My... We are, are done with done? the news. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So my next article <laughs> All right. yes. is about proteins. We're going, we're getting weird. Yes. My next article includes two methodologies that are called ancestral protein reconstruction and deep mutational scanning. Uh-huh. So it's a Michael Crichton novel. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh, this is a this is a very technical one, so I'm going to try to do my best to explain it uh, 
simply and, and, and understandably, and we'll post in, it on the blog as always. And lots of biochemistry. Yes. So this is a study by Starr et al. 2017 in Nature. Oh, I should point out, because you've been saying the first names of your authors, and I had forgotten to do that. This is Tyler Starr et al., and the last one was Delphine Angst et al. Ooh, I like that name. Yeah. So you were talking about dolphins. <laughs> so the point of this one was to, to, to look at how proteins evolve over time mm -hmm. and ask the question of how the specific mutations that occur influence the evolutionary processes following them and if the major evolutionary shifts that occur because of those mutations are special in any way. Yes. Uh, spoilers, not so much, but we'll get to that. <laughs> so the first thing they did was this uh, process called ancestral protein reconstruction. And, and the way that that works, they were looking at uh, steroid hormone receptors. So these are proteins that uh, are basically receive hormones like testosterone and estrogen and then activate genes to do certain things. Yes. So your cell, this gets testosterone, and it tells your body to start producing adrenaline or, you know, whatever else your testosterone is, is kicking off in your body. Yeah. Um, the link that I just made is probably totally made up. I'm not a biochemist. <laughs> what they did was they looked at these protein receptors throughout various different groups of life, how they're related, how they've mutated over time, to reconstruct what the, uh, the first proteins of this type would have looked like. And what they found was that the ancient version of this protein, right, the starting state of this protein, would have been an estrogen receptor mm -hmm. or something very much like it. And then there were a, a, a few key mutations that occurred to the protein structure that allowed it to expand out to recognize other molecules. Interesting. So this is a shift that would have happened way back, right? This is before vertebrates existed. Yeah, yes. This is at the base of the animal family tree 500 plus million years ago. That mutational series allowed for all the hormonal diversity that we see in animals today, which is really, really cool. So the next thing they did was to say, could it have mutated other ways? What if yeah. what if a slightly different mutation had happened instead? They say there are three key mutations that occur. Yeah. And that changes the protein, which means that mutations in the future are now limited. So the mutations that occur at the beginning of this protein's evolution are going to affect how it can change in the future. That's going yeah. to rule out some mutations and, and bring in some new possibilities. Yes. So could it have been different? And as it turns out, yeah, it totally could have. They s did this. So this brings us to the deep mutational scanning, where basically they came up with a massive list with computerized assistance of all the possible variants that could have happened to this protein. All the possible mutations. And they got a total list of 160,000 possible variants in the DNA that codes for this protein. So a few. Just a few. Yeah. All right. And then they tested those mutations in yeast. So they created this protein, oh, cool. gave it to yeast, and tested out these to see how they functioned after these each of these different mutations would have happened. Mm -hmm. As you'd expect, a lot of them just didn't work, because mutation. Mm -hmm. A bunch yep. of them it just didn't change anything. They worked just fine. They found more than 800 possible variants that would have changed the function in the same way as the mutation that did occur, some oh. of which would have done it better. Interesting. So there were mutation possibilities that would have created the exact same effect, in some cases more efficiently, and if any of those had happened, who knows how that would have affected the continued evolution of these proteins for the next 500 million years. Mm -hmm. Which brings up this really interesting point that even if the mutation you get for a new feature is not the most efficient version that it could have been, 
the one you get is the one you're stuck with. Yes. And that this this highlight as as the the press release said this highlights the role of chance in the mm-hmm. sequence that we see in evolutionary time. That's really cool. It's it that touches on something that we've often talked about where the mentality behind evolution is or the the public perspective is often that it is things improving and constantly yes. getting closer toward the optimum which it is not evolution is the survival of the ones that are at least good enough yeah and it's with whatever tool you ended up with mm-hmm. if this is the mutation that happened to occur yeah it theoretically could have been done more efficiently it could have been a better one but you didn't get that one yeah well it's it's sort of like if you if you're building a tool to do a job you know around the house or on your farm back before we had major technology mm-hmm. And you get a tool that does the job exactly the way you wanted it to do it, and in a time amount that you were, you know, that was better than you were taking and you are willing to take to do it, are you then going to continue to waste time perfecting that tool yeah. if it's already doing the job? It works. Do? Yeah, it works. So, you're, you know, evolution is not going to, that is not a something that just is constantly like, yes, but we could shave two, it's not <laughs> how we're doing Olympic races. We could shave two thirds of a second off of the amount of time. Yeah. No, it's once it reaches a point, the pressures on that selection now are not nearly as extreme because it's not yeah. giving you a real edge over the other uh, individuals of your species. And the real difference there, of course, is that evolution can't choose its mutations and it can't yes. choose the direction it wants, air quotes, to go. Mm-hmm. It's just rolling with whatever changes occur. And that's, it's, is, yeah. I'm 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 blown away by... How many other options there were? That's the part. Eight hundred ways to do the same thing or better. Like that's like saying that if you got a corrupted bit of code in a, a computer program um, that caused it to act different, but you could have also had a whole bunch of other different pieces of the code also be affected differently and still have the exact like that's yeah. you know you think people often think about DNA as computer code to where it's like you can find exactly which part it was that malfunctioned. Mm-hmm. You know, and here it's like, well, yeah, they all affect it slightly differently, but they all get the general job done when you, yeah. you know, if you were to change it there. And they all change the playing field in different ways, which has domino effect for the next forever. So there's I also like 800 the... other quantum states where those yes. different <laughs> mutations happened, and who knows what life looks like. Maybe it's different, maybe it's not. What a cool thing to think about. <laughs> The especially efficient one is the one where we finally have flying cars. And, uh, <laughs> if only the estrogen receptor had modified this way. <laughs> where we're all incredibly intelligent and things are sleek and we've figured out cold fusion. Yeah, because our estrogen receptor mutated this way and a butterfly flapped its wings. And, and, the, and it was just everything came together perfectly. Schrodinger finally opened that box. Uh, <laughs> the cat was alive. It's just a great, it's just a great place. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's talk humans. Let's talk about ourselves. Let's talk about, hey, if, uh, if there's one thing that Will and I are good at, <laughs> it's talking about ourselves. We, we love the things we make when it gets put on movie screens. So. <laughs> <laughs> so, human evolution is... The, the way that we are going to start this, right? Because obviously human evolution starts four billion years ago when organismal mm-hmm. evolution starts. But we're going to yes. zero in a little bit closer. Humans are primates. Mm-hmm. We have all the features you'd expect from primates. We have our forward-facing eyes with color vision. We have mm-hmm. extremely mobile arms. Our lower arm can rotate. Our upper arm is got this wonderful shoulder joint. We've got a clavicle which most other groups don't have. We've mm-hmm. got grasping hands. We've got fingerprints that help with holding on to things. Our beautiful opposable thumbs. Yes, we've got small noses, right? Short snouts mm-hmm. like primates generally have. We've got these wonderful grinding omnivore teeth. Primates often have big brains, complex behavior. Social structures are very common among yes. primates. Heavily social. Yep, very smart problem-solving intelligence. Mm -hmm. All of these are things that we've inherited along with all of our primate cousins. Yes. 
For more on primate evolution, episode 7, our friend Ethan helped us to talk about primates. Yes, he did. But one particular group of primates that we that, that, that showed up about 30 million years ago or so that we still have today are the apes. Mm-hmm. Apes are typically big. They are tailless. They include gibbons, which are called the lesser apes, which is a misnomer because they are uh, probably the best apes. They're, they 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 are just <laughs> slightly nudged in the second place by my orangutans. <laughs> Gibbons are, Gibbons are they so are. cool. Oh, they're so like you just look up a video of them swinging around. Yeah. It's hypnotic. <laughs> and then there are the great apes. Two species of orangutans, mm-hmm. two species of gorilla, and two species called chimpanzee and bonobos mm-hmm. and homo sapiens. Us. Yes. We are different from all other primates, all other apes, for a handful of features, right? We're very strange. We're very weird. Every every ape species is unique, but we mm. are very divergent. We, we've got all these weirdly bizarre yes. features. We have giant alien heads Yark. that contain our super giant brains. Are ridiculously... We're like the greys, which yeah. is giant bulgy heads. To all other animals, that's what we look like. It's just yeah. big old, huge eyes, big brains. And we swoop into their habitat, and we take all their resources. Skinny, wimpy limbs. We abduct them, and we do tests yep. on them. We have really flat faces, right? Not just small faces, mm-hmm. but flat faces, small teeth. We are specialized for bipedal walking. Our yeah. legs, our hips, our spines are very much adapted for walking, whereas... Compared to other primates, our arms are short. They are not mm-hmm. nearly as flexible and mobile because we're not climbing. We are not as sexually dimorphic as a lot of other primates. Yes. Males and females are very similar in humans compared to other animals. And, famously, we, according to ourselves, are very, very smart. Mm-hmm. I mean, mo- a lot of us. Yeah. <laughs> Most of us <laughs> are very, very smart. We have. We all know something. <laughs> We, <laughs> even the dumbest humans, are really insanely smart compared yes, to other animals. When compared We've to got most crazy complex animals. culture. We've got mm-hmm. ridiculously complex language. We've got an advanced technology. Mm-hmm. We are extremely unique in a lot of ways. But that stuff didn't come out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. There is an extensive fossil record, an extensive evolutionary history over which we see these features gradually develop. Yeah, and it really is, extensive is the, the key word there, as we were saying at the beginning. Like, There's a lot that people have looked into this and found. There is. And it's incredible. A lot. More on that in a second. Yeah. The origins of our lineage go back. So we do um, molecular clock analysis, mm-hmm. where we compare how we relate to other organisms and determine where how long those changes would have would have occurred. Our closest relatives, based on all accounts, are chimps and bonobos. Yes. That is to say that we had an ancestor that we shared with chimps and bonobos that was a cousin of the ancestors of gorillas, which are our next closest relatives. There was a species or a population of ancient ape that lived at a time where there were lots of ancient apes, right? The Miocene was a heyday for ancient apes. Yeah. This ancient population was successful enough that it gave rise to two lines of descendants. Both lines of descendants survived up till the present. One line has two living descendants, chimps and bonobos. The other line has only us as living descendants. Starting at the descendants of that ancestor and coming all the way down the tree to the modern day where only we remain, that is the lineage that we are going to focus on for the rest of this discussion. That group is commonly called hominins. Mm -hmm. It's not always called hominins. The taxonomy and naming of things in human evolution is ridiculously complicated. Very contentious. Yep. But for the purposes of this episode, we're going to say that everything from our first ancestor after the one we share with chimps to today are hominins. 
that's everything closer to us than to any other living species on the planet. Yes, and there's a lot that falls into that, more than you might think. Yes. So, like Will was starting to hint at, and we have to take a, step, a second to mention this, the fossil record of human evolution is... You know, we always talk, whenever you talk about the fossil record, you always have to add the little caveats. We're missing mm-hmm. information, we don't have all the data, which is always true. We're using the evidence yes. from the things we do have to infer things about the places where we don't have information. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That being said, the fossil record of human, of hominins is ridiculously complete. We're looking at yeah, something it's... like 15 to 20 different species represented mm-hmm. by literally thousands of fossils. Mm-hmm. The common ancestor that we share with chimps is inferred to have lived, usually it's inferred to be around 6 to 8 million years ago maybe mm-hmm. a little more, in that six to eight million years since then, the fossil record is littered with evidence of our ancestors. It's really, it's really cool because complete, you know, the more complete a fossil record, the more we can learn. Mm-hmm. But it's, it's mind blowing at times. Yeah. And it's not too crazy because we're, we're fairly recent considering that we're still here and yeah. that our ancestors showed up. And, you know, so it's not surprising that there are intact fossils, but that there are so many is really, really interesting. Yeah, and there's probably a few reasons, right? Like you said, we're mm-hmm. recent, so there's not yep. been a lot of time for things to disappear. Uh, we're also big, and big animals yeah. fossilize better. We tend to forget that. And this has been studied more than probably any other f- topic in evolutionary science, which means people that's have a, been that's looking for it. Mm-hmm. And this brings us to the biggest paradox of the subject of human evolution, and that is the paradox that all science has, which is the more data you have, the more questions you have. Yes. I think it's really easy to read the headlines and think that we have no idea what we're talking about, because it's constantly, this species lived earlier than we thought, and this one's not even named that, and we have no idea what this one's related to, and the changing the tree of human evolution and it's important to remember that studies on human evolution are coming out literally every week yes and so we're constantly debating and we're constantly discussing every minute detail which can mask the reality of just how much great information we have about this sequence of evolution yeah it's it and we've mentioned this before because it because of how often you see articles updating or you know correcting or disproving a previous you know discovery or article mm-hmm. it's often easy to seem that way especially with this one when there are so many articles coming out and many of times they are about previously discovered specimens it's not yeah. always a new discovery it's usually you know we did a new you know, a bit of research or use a new technique on this specimen and found out more information on it that corrected or, you know, adjusted information we already had. And we've mentioned this before, as I said, but the thing to remember in these cases is it's not that we're going, oh, it turns out it's actually a monkey. <laughs> it's, <Yeah. laughs> we're saying it turns out it's actually a little older than we thought. Right. Or it turns out that it actually had a slightly different feature then we, you know, it's, it's teeth or it's brain case was actually, yep. you know, different. We're tweaking the details. You know, the overall picture is fairly robust and strong. Uh, there are aspects that are still some big questions out there that need to be answered, but yeah. it's those details. And as you said, when you have more data, you get more questions. A lot of those questions are very specific, but it's still there oh, yeah. to be answered. And, and it's hard to tell it apart when you're answering a big question versus a very specific question. Yes. And so you'll see as we go through this discussion where a lot of the uncertainty is, and there are even confounding effects, uh, uh, weird mm-hmm. situations that come up in the science of human evolution that don't happen in other fields specifically because of how much material we have to work with. Yeah. So... Let's start at the beginning. Jumping on in. Hominins. Like I said, the inferred ancestry 
uh, of hominins kicks off probably around six to eight million years ago. This is at a time where there's lots of ancient apes. And to, to, to imagine what our earliest ancestors would have looked like, right? There were no chimps yet. There were no gorillas yet. Mm -hmm. But they probably would have fit well alongside chimps and gorillas at the zoo. Right? They would have looked very ape-like. Um, we don't know exactly what the first hominins in the fossil record are. There are a handful of different fossils that look like they might be, that, that are showing the beginnings of hominin traits. So uh, most prominently, there is a an ape called Sahelanthropus, which comes from Chad in Africa, which is between six and seven million years old. There's another one called Aurorin from Kenya, which is around six million years old. And then earlier this year, a paper came out that looked <laughs> at Grecopithecus, which is from Greece from 7 million years ago and pointed out that it might also be a, a, a member of our of our clade as well and a very early member. There are also footprints that were discovered that, that were discussed very recently in Crete, which is also a Greek island that might mm -hmm. belong to early hominins. And between all these different groups we're seeing these the hints, the barest hints of the beginning of hominin traits possible adaptations in the limbs, the pelvis, the skull for a more upright posture, mm -hmm. uh, facial features like the size of the teeth. Like I said, uh, humans have smaller teeth in general. Yeah. We have thicker enamel. And so they're just the li little hints that these are, I, this is a group of, of, of fossil apes that are probably either the earliest hominins or very close to the earliest hominins. Yeah, it's, again, the thing that we talk about very often is the at what point is a thing what it was or what it will be. Like, yes. There is no clear line between ape hominin. It's yes. Somewhere in there, there's one that could be, could be argued to be on either side of the line because it's in that transition. Yeah. And so it's hard to really tease out at what point have you crossed over. Yes, and indeed that crossover species, even if you decide on it, probably had a bunch of really close relatives that look very similar to it that mm -hmm. didn't give rise to the rest of the clade. And so it's very... Yes. And we talk about it's it's always difficult to pinpoint the beginning of a group. Yeah. So let's jump ahead a little bit. The first generally accepted hominin in the fossil record is an ape called Artipithecus. Is this when we make the obligatory your great 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 so and so? Yeah. Grandfather, grandmother. Will's gonna keep saying great 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 for the rest of the episode. Yes. While I go on to discuss everything else. We'll put it on a separate track so you can mute that one. Just in the background. You know what's funny? Because on the one hand, that would be really fun to do, and on the other hand, if I were a listener, that would bother me so much. Oh, you know, nope. I'd be like, all right, well. This episode was a good idea. We'll wait <laughs> until it. two right weeks up until they, to tune back. they did that. <laughs> Just great, 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 <laughs> great, great. <laughs> so Artie Pithecus, very famous, often called Artie, affectionately. Yeah. Artie Pithecus, there are actually two species, both from Ethiopia. Artie Pithecus cadaba from around five and a half million years ago, and Artie Pithecus ramidus from around four and a half million years ago. These, again, very, you know, very much like what you'd expect other apes to look like, mm -hmm. except they have these little, you know, Artipithecus has these hints, right? They're just beginnings of the development of hominin features. Starting to lean that yes, way. Yes, the face is prognathic, which is to say that the jaw protrudes forward, but not as much as other apes. The front teeth, the incisors and canines, are just a little smaller than you normally see. Mm -hmm. The enamel on the teeth is a little thicker than you normally see. The space between the canines and incisors, which is called the diastema, is a little smaller than in other apes. Mm -hmm. the, there's no, uh, they've lost, in, in other apes, the um, upper canine and the lower premolar meet when the mouth closes. And it mm -hmm. sharpens the teeth, and Artipithecus does not have that. Which is a shame, because that'd be cool to still have. Yeah, it would. So all these features, right, all these skull features are, are, are the very beginnings of hominin features. It is small-brained. 
with a skull mm -hmm. volume estimated at, you know, just over 300 cubic centimeters, which is very similar to what we see in modern chimps and such. Yeah. Uh, I mention that only because it's going to be a trend. Our heads yeah. are going to expand like balloons for the next 5 million years. And so the, these early ones looked very much like short-faced chimps than they did long-faced humans. Yes, yes, yes. They have a similar structure, but it's shortening up and it's starting to get more and more human facial features yeah. before we get to the brain. One of the most interesting features of Artipithecus, one of the things that makes it most famous, is that its pelvic features uh -huh. suggest hints of adaptations to upright walking, walking on two mm -hmm. feet. Uh, there's a lot of debate over how exactly could it walk, was it bipedal, was it always bipedal, and like I said, there are features in the hips that are similar to what we see in humans, but otherwise their arms are big and beefy and very flexible. They they have grasping feet. They have what's called the divergent big toe, which is when you look at apes, mm -hmm. right? They've got four toes lined up, and then the fifth toe is off to the side. Add that to the list of things I wish we had in the <laughs> hand feet. Oh, I I I have. If you ask any of my friends from college. You can. They'll tell you about the rants I used to go on about if I could make myself monkey fist like from King Possible, <laughs> I would. With hand feet. Oh, I love them. Yeah, Artipithecus still has hand feet. It's still got all you know. So it's it's this. It's it's an ape with a little bit of a short face, a little bit smaller teeth, possibly walking on two feet sometimes, but still a good climber, still small brained, all this stuff. Something uh, quick, quick, uh, interesting note when it comes to the whether or not it walked upright and. You know, we'll we'll get into more of the upright gait later on, but the reason you know it, it's not surprising that there's debate over whether or not Artie could walk upright or not, because that debate was going on with chimps. Oh yeah, when in earlier, you know, researches of them, it was often thought that chimps could only walk upright when they were in water, and the buoyancy of the water was helping keep their torso up. Right, right. Until Jane Goodall finally brought back pictures of them walking around. Yeah. Uh, and she did that with lots of things about chimps, of saying, hey, you can stop being dumb now, because I, I went and found out. <laughs> I got all this. <laughs> Look at all these things I'm proving. Because she's, she's fantastic. Uh, but, like, we didn't know for a long time whether they could, so, you know, let alone whether or not one that's just a fossil yeah. is able to do it sometimes, do it out of water, in water, do it at all. You know. So, yeah, with, with Artie, the question is really how much was it doing it? How good was it at? Because mm -hmm. chimps can do it, but they're not good at it. That's not yeah, their default exactly. position. It's not their preferred. Yeah. Until they get the virus, and then they then they start standing up right after they right, learn how to talk. Right, and they're talking, and they're, they're using yeah. weapons and all that stuff. So something yes, to look forward to. They have damn dirty hands. <laughs> um. <laughs> dirty paws. <laughs> <laughs> We start to see more of those features show up. So, mm -hmm. Artipithecus is followed by an extremely famous group of apes called the Australopithecines. Yes. The Australopithecines, and, and specifically the genus Australopithecus, which you have probably heard before. It's probably the most famous non-homo genus in our, our lineage. Australopithecus includes several different species... That start showing up around 4 million years ago, just after Artie, and mm -hmm. go until more recently than 2 million years ago. Australopithecines are known from Kenya, Ethiopia, Tanzania, South Africa, from hundreds of specimens. Yeah. This was a long-lived, very widespread, very successful group of hominins. We'll talk a little bit more about their diversity in a second, but first, what makes Australopithecines interesting? Yes. Basically, they, in a lot of features, they are in between Ardipithecus and humans. Yep. So, brain size. We are now seeing brain sizes in the 300s to 500s of cubic centimeters. Mm -hmm. So, not nowhere close to us, but bigger than those earlier groups. Uh... Bigger than, than what you see in most apes. They have right small teeth again, they're, but, they're, but their jaws are still wide. So if you look yeah. at our teeth, we have this very curved shape, this sort of what's called a parabola. 
Yeah, it's a like a horseshoe. Yes, yeah, so yeah, that's a great example. Our teeth are shaped like a horseshoe in our mouth, whereas in Australopithecines, it was more wide. It was more like a U, like a spread out U in their mouth. But they have thick enamel, again, on their teeth, thicker than Ardipithecus, not as thick as later humans. Their uh, wrists are not as mobile compared to other apes. They're closer to what we see in our wrists. But at the same time, they've got a lot in common with other apes. They appear to grow fast. Right? They have a short childhood, which is something that humans definitely don't have. Yeah, ask any parent. Yes. <laughs> and they're strongly sexually dimorphic. Males were larger. They had big canines, which is something you see in chimps and gorillas as well. Yeah. But the thing that is most famous about the Australopithecines is that they are the first members of our hominin lineage that were definitely bipedal. So let's take a second. Which is really cool. And talk about what it means to be bipedal. Bipedal means walking on two feet. We are not the only animals that do this. Uh, we're not the coolest animals that do this. No. <laughs> there, were way be- there were way better animals <laughs> that have figured this out in way cooler ways. Yep. <laughs> but what's odd about the way we do it, right? Because so dinosaurs and birds are bipedal, but their bodies are horizontal on top of their feet. Yes, they're still having to balance yes. head like and tail. Like a seesaw. The head and tail on either side. Kangaroos are bipedal, but they lean on their tail. And they still, when walking, use their forelimbs and tail, but they run on two, or hop. Yes. Humans are super bizarre. Our spines have shifted up. We have vertical sitting directly on top of our bodies. There's a whole bunch of specialized attributes up and down our body that allow us to do this. The place where our spine meets our skull, a hole called the foramen magnum, sits underneath the skull instead of in the back of the skull. And it's rotated down. Yeah. Our spine has these specific curves in it that allow it to balance on top of our hips. It positions the body straight over the pelvis. Our hips, the ilium especially, is expanded outward to support the muscles that balance the torso on top of the hips. Our femur, where our femur attaches to our thigh bone, attaches to the hips angles inward to place our legs directly under our bodies. Our knee joint is flat, so the top of the tibia and the bottom of the femur meet and it's very flat, which is more support. Our feet are arched. Our toes are all in a straight line instead of having the thumb off to the side, which Will is very upset about. Womp, womp, womp. So we've got all these features that are, are, are allow us to walk the way that we do, uh, which is even more impressive when you consider our giant balloon heads. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's really a, a feat of balance when you think about it. Like, you know, it's one thing to be balancing like a seesaw or like a, a tightrope water, walker stick, mm-hmm. but we're like when you balance something on your nose above you. Like, yeah, I am constantly our whole body. Anytime I stumble, I'm amazed I don't fall right over. Right? And the the fact that we don't even have classes, you just figure that out as a baby by falling over a whole bunch. <laughs> yeah. And then you eventually like, oh, no, I got it. My body's figured it out. Right? I peop- I could stand on one foot yeah. for multiple seconds at least. The, to to really drive this home, if you really want to understand why this is so impressive and why we it, it may seem like we're, you know, going gaga <laughs> over something that's very simple day to day. Look up videos of people trying to program robots to walk. Yes. Look up things of walking <laughs> robots. Robots have a tough and time. Make sure to look up old ones. Like, <laughs> we have a robot that can actually walk very well. Uh, it's Big Dog and Little Dog. But yep. they're tetrapod. They're quadrupedal. They walk on four legs. But you can kick them and they'll catch themselves. They can jump over stuff. They can run at yeah. decent this speeds. This is Boston Dynamics, right? Yeah. Yes. Look up humanoid walking robots. <laughs> And it's hilarious. It's a hard thing to do. It's really hard to program all the minute servo movements and programmings and sensors. Because you have to have motion sensors in every direction if you're standing like that. And servos to constantly adjust every little bit. And if you push them at all, they just go like they're drunk. Just face down. We're we're built like living, moving skyscrapers. Yes. And it's really really interesting it's fat and 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 it's one of the things that makes us 
one, it's one of the most unique features of 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 humans and our which our is relatives. I think why Australopithecus has gotten so much attention. Yes, because when you look at if you looked at it in you know, an early hominin and it's crouched over like an ape, it's like all right, and it's covered in fur and it looks very you know chimpanzee like. You're like okay, yeah, that's not us. Yeah. Or if you come forward and you look at like a, a more early one where it's most likely hairless, but it's a little different. You're like, all right, but I can see that you're close to us. To have something that was probably very, you know, a typical ape-looking, but walking like us, yeah. it's very alien. It's, that it's very Star valley. Trek. Yes, well, it, and it, so it's really interesting. And it's like what you see in the Planet of the Apes movies. Mm-hmm. Walking on two legs, but still with those ape proportions. Yes, Which, and so it's very unsettling in a way, but very fascinating. Yes, and that is pretty much exactly what we see in Australopithecus. Mm-hmm. So Australopithecus has leg bones that are so that you know the ankle bone, the the lower leg bone are adapted for more weight bearing, for more balance and stability. The knee joint is wide, so it's wide and flat, similar to what we see in humans. The foramen magnum, where the spine meets the skull, is more underneath the skull compared to earlier species and other apes where it's in the back. It's got the beginnings of that spinal curve that we see in ourselves, but it's got short, stocky legs. It's got Mm -hmm. long arms. It's got curved fingers and toes, which is something that we see in climbing animals. You see that in other primates. Yeah, around those branches. Yep. So it's got these incredible intermediates, right? Some things that are very much like us, some things that are very much not, and some things that are on the way in between in terms of bipedalism. The most famous evidence for Australopithecine bipedalism comes from one of the most famous fossil sites in the world. That is the Laetoli track site in Tanzania. At Laetoli, there are about 70 footprints associated with Australopithecus that show not only straight toes, no hand Mm -hmm. feet, but clearly two individuals walking on two feet. Yes. Balancing themselves, walking across this ancient volcanic ash on two feet. Really, really famous. Huge deal when it was discovered. Mm -hmm. A lot of early hominin discoveries are attributed to famous folks like the Leakeys. The leaky family. Yeah. Uh, bipedalism is also a very, you, you know, there's a lot of discussion over why and when and how yeah. bipedalism actually showed up. You know, what are the benefits of being bipedal in the first place? And it's 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 something that's been going, you know, back and forth on certain answers or you know aspects of it for for a while. Yeah. Because it's it's a tough question to answer, you know. We, we talked about the same thing when it was snakes losing their legs of what is the actual benefit. Yes. You know, or which of the benefits that we can see now was the one that made the change. Yes. Because that's the other thing is, all right, but what if there's five benefits? <laughs> Can't be all of them at once, most likely, because some of them are very different. Mm-hmm. So which one was it that caused things to start, you know, standing upright and actually surviving because of it. Yeah. So there's a bunch of benefits to being bipedal, right? The, yeah. the, 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 the most obvious one for me is that it frees up your hands. Yes, exactly. For activities. We can carry stuff. Yeah, you can carry stuff. You can manipulate things in your environment. It's one of the, the, the most incredible features of primates in general, that we mm-hmm. can plop us, you know, sit down on a tree branch or something and then fiddle with things. Yeah. With our hands. Which is is a huge benefit. Yeah. Bipedalism allows us to do it on the move. Yeah. And without it, we would never have gotten to pole vault. This is true. Yeah. Speaking of on the move, it also allows us to cover more distance more efficiently. Humans are very efficient walkers. Which is something that surprises a lot of people, that we are... We're we're more efficient at long-distance walking than a lot of other animals. Yeah. And that surprises a lot of people, because typically all you hear about when you're comparing human bodies to other animals is how much more extreme they are than us. Yes. And we're weak and and pathetic. Exactly. But walking is one of the areas we excel in. That's why there are huntsmen that are able to walk down their prey. Yeah. Just by tracking 
and walking, they do not tire as quickly as the prey does, and the prey eventually collapses out of exhaustion, and then they just spear. Yeah. So you've got efficient locomotion, like, you've got long-distance travel. It also makes you taller. Yeah. Long-distance sight. Long-distance sight. You're also more intimidating. Yeah, uh, which is something that uh, affects how we interact with animals still today. Yeah, and it's something that always throws throws me off when I think about other animals. Because, you know, humans are uh, about the size of a wolf, which mm-hmm. is a weird thought in my head. Because when I think of a wolf, I, I well, I'm, I'm way bigger than a wolf. Like, no, I'm just yeah. taller than a wolf. If, a, if yeah. you bent well, a wolf upright, this... the wolf would be the same size as mm-hmm. me. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, it's. It, I think about that every now and then when it's stuff like cows. So it's like, this thing weighs like 10 of them <laughs> plus something. Like, yeah. This thing is huge, but I am patting it on the back. Yes. You know, because I grew up in North <laughs> uh, yeah. I don't. I don't pat cows here <laughs> in Long Island. <laughs> Yes, you at the at the grocery store. Uh, <laughs> the cow, the things that I see on the milk cartons. Yeah, so I, this those aren't very big at all. <laughs> They're tiny. They're right <laughs> in the milk carton. So one of the interesting things about Australopithecus is you can imagine an animal that gets all these benefits of standing up when it's on the ground, but can also run up a tree really fast. Yeah, uh, and there's a lot of question about when did well, when did it start? Why did it start? One of the most common explanations that I've heard is the thought that, you know, living in the grasslands, you can stand up and exactly. peer over the tall grass. But it's worth pointing out that a lot of these ancient hominins are found in environments that were forested. Yeah, and a lot of modern primates are found in grasslands. Yes. So that's <laughs> an interesting one. Um, but at the same time, you can definitely imagine being good at locomotion across more open habitats. Yeah, traveling across the field. It's also worth pointing out that Australopithecines were living alongside other ancient apes. Mm-hmm. So it could very easily just be that walking bipedally let them do something different. And that yeah, regardless it, of what specific things it was allowing them to do, as long as it was different, it allowed them to, to build a niche for themselves without having to compete with the other apes. Exactly. Instead of making them more efficient at something they were already doing, it may have opened a niche and that in and of itself is often a, a huge boon for any animal that can can find the ability to do it. Indeed. A quick note about Australopithecines. So I, I've so far we've been talking about these as though they are one type of animal, and that's yes. a bit misleading because there are at least five or six species of Australopithecus, mm-hmm. ranging from very old to much younger. The earliest species. Uh, is, is often, at least the one that's considered the early species, is Australopithecus anamensis, all the way down mm-hmm. to the most recent species, Australopithecus sediba. And not only does Australopithecus in general occupy these intermediate traits between Ardipithecus and later humans, but the earliest Australopithecines are more like early hominins, and the later Australopithecines are more like humans, so that mm-hmm. even between the species and the group, you're still seeing these gradual shifts, increased adaptations in the skull and the body, so much yeah. so that there's argument whether or not the earliest Australopithecine species should be considered Ardipithecus, and there's mm-hmm. argument over whether or not the youngest Australopithecines should be considered Homo. <laughs> that Australopithecus sediba, some have suggested it should be Homo sediba. Yeah. And so there's this beautiful transition through them. And the other thing that I really want to point out, because, I, you know, there are famous Australopithecines, right? Yes. Australopithecus afarensis is a species that is known from a few different countries, but it is famous for producing a, a specimen named Lucy. Yes. Which was, by all accounts, a little girl. And I think... And, 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 you know, Australopithecus africanus from South Africa uh, is famous for a particular si- uh, a specimen na- known as the Tong Child, mm-hmm. a little bit younger mm-hmm. than Lucy. And I've seen people talk about these as though they think those are the only ones. Yeah, that, that, this is the Australopithecus. Right. Lucy gets a lot of that. I think Lucy gets so much attention that people get the impression in their head that, oh, okay, Lucy is the representative of Australopithecus afarensis. Yeah. But Lucy was found with a family group. 
And Australopithecus afarensis is known from at least three different countries, Ethiopia, Kenya, Tanzania, and around 400 specimens. Pretty good. And then Africanus is known from at least three different sites. All the different specimens are known. Like I said, the, the different species range over four different countries, at least over two million years or more. Mm -hmm. This is, like we said, we have really, really good fossil records of these hominins at this time. These are, this isn't just one weird skeleton. This is several hundred fantastic populations showing these beautiful features early on in hominin evolution. You can really get a, a really beautiful transition when you put all of the the various specimens of yes. uh, our ancestry in, a, in, you know, it, it, in order of seeing things slowly but surely shaping closer and closer to our modern anatomy. Yes, and it fits, right, we, we talked in, in episode 12 about how we date fossils and how we determine the order of events in the geologic records. Yes. Not only are these traits, you know, following from youngest to oldest in the fossil record, because we have such great records of a lot of these ancient hominins, they're dated really, really well. Yes. So you'll see uh, lots of radiometric dates, especially places like Laetoli, where there's ash layers, mm -hmm. which you can potassium argon date and such stuff like that. But they're also, in a lot of cases, young enough that we can go, there's a lot of different corroborating techniques we can use. And then we can use you know, paleomagnetic yeah. dating, and also there's lots and lots of methods that get used on these. And that's a lot of the articles, as we mentioned earlier, that you see coming out is tweaking those dates as they get narrowed further and further in. Yes, indeed. You, know, you don't you don't get a perfect date typically out of one study. You get it out of multiple comparisons and studies. Yes. You know, as you continue to narrow the band of the date range and you continue to zero it in the right direction. Absolutely. Now, one thing that we should have mentioned earlier, and we did not, shame on you, Will. I'm sorry. The the other big misconception that comes out with human evolution is we think of all of these species as forming a line. Yes. That it goes. And that, that was one thing I was thinking of as I was yep. making the comparison is I didn't want to make it seem like you should put them in a line. I avoided yep, using yep. that word because it almost came out. And there are, right, some of these species are thought potentially to be direct ancestors of the others. Yes. But in general, what we're looking at are branches on a tree meandering its way in the direction of features that we have, that we see in, mo in, in more modern and recent humans. Uh, so a lot of these species could be side branches, especially some of the weird ones. Like there's a, 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 an ape called Kenyanthropus, which might just be an offshoot that lived alongside mm -hmm. the Australopithecus. Most famously, there is a genus that is sometimes, called, sometimes grouped uh, in the genus Paranthropus. Mm -hmm. Other people consider them just to be part of Australopithecus but they are referred to as the robust Australopiths. Right. This is a few species uh, from all the same countries uh, as the other Australopithecines we've seen that are Australopithecines with big, beefy faces mm -hmm. that are not thought to be directly ancestral to us, just a separate group of Australopithecines. They've got big, grinding molars, their faces are wide. They've got all these projections on the cheeks and the top of the skull for muscle attachment. They've got yeah. these big, deep jaws, which are all adaptations we typically see in animals that are eating really tough food, especially vegetation. And my favorite part of it is that these are all features that are convergent with gorillas. Oh, uh, that's cool. So this was a group of bipedal ancient hominins doing their best impressions of gorillas. This is the the ancestry to the Morlocks. <laughs> yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> so alongside these Australopithecine ancestors, we had these this sort of beefy, possibly more vegetarian, possibly eating more, you know, nuts and seeds and stuff, yeah. hanging out next to them, uh, doing their own thing. And that that's the thing that it's really easy to forget whenever talking about the evolution of a group, you know, is that it's not a single pathway. Yes. It's, there were multiple bipedal apes mm -hmm. that were 
different species living together at the same time or very close to the same times or overlapping and somewhere in there one of those did eventually give rise to our line of ancestry Mm -hmm. but they all shared very similar traits so even though we see the same sort of transition of the facial features and the physical features that doesn't mean that just because they're starting to look more like us they are the direct line to us yes the whole group is making a very similar transition as it goes. Yes, and then we emerge somewhere within that group. Yes. There is a line somewhere to us. Yeah. Much the way that birds emerged within dinosaurs. Yeah, exactly. And that's another thing that comes up a lot with, with the fossil record. It is almost impossible to identify the direct ancestor of anything. Yeah, it's, it's you know, without being able to do family genetic studies. Yeah. You know, there's... It's I wouldn't be able to pull your, you know, great 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 grandparents out of a lineup. Yes, exactly. Just by looking at them, you know, I you would have to do the genetic studies. This is why you'll find lots of paleontologists and even just scientists that really dislike that typical uh, marching of the the march of man. Oh yeah, it's transitional really posters. Yeah, it's it's very that is part of the reason that there's so much confusion about human evolution is. It gets portrayed as once there was a monkey and then eventually there was us. So it's like that's that's like saying, you know, once people invented guns and then we had a world war. Yeah. <laughs> uh, like you're 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 leaving out a lot of the yeah. middle stuff. Technically that transition happened, right? That is Yes. But it was amidst all this other diversity. The other thing that that depiction is misleading about is that it propagates this very, very ancient and very, very ingrained perception that evolution was aiming at humanity. Yes, that it's it. We were the end goal, yes, which we were not, right? And and we keep mentioning that human features keep showing up, which is the wrong way to say it. It's that features more and more similar to modern hominins, which is to say us. Yes are gradually being favored, but they're not the only features being favored, right? The robust australopiths, paranthropists, are doing their own thing. They've got, mm-hmm. they're on Absolutely. that way, they've got a bunch of those features, and then they went off to the side and went, oh yeah, we're going to go chew on nuts and seeds or whatever. Yeah. We were the end result for us. Yes, we happened to be the last <laughs> ones. Exactly, but we were not the goal yes. for hominins. And all this actually brings up the, the question of taxonomy and, and, and identifying where the relationships between groups, because at the mm-hmm. same time that Paranthropus is emerging amongst the ranks of Australopithecines, so is a new genus around two million years ago named Homo, a genus we will talk about at length here in a little bit. Yeah. But we're talking about, right, where do we draw the line between, you know, where does Ardipithecus become Australopithecus, and where does Australopithecus finally give rise to Homo, and there's all these different species, and it's always the case in in paleontology that, right, we, we discussed this in the past, that these taxonomic categories are arbitrary, right? We mm-hmm. decided these. We, we say, all right, this is where the genus begins, this is where the genus ends, and that evolution, because it's gradual change, doesn't actually give us, right, it's like trying to say, it's like the, the path between a ch- from child to adult, right? Yeah. I know a child when I see it, I know an adult when I see it, but there's no line where it changes over, it's just a gradual shift. Mm-hmm. And in the fossil record, normally this isn't a problem, because normally what you get is just like, all right, this horse is 25 million years old, and this horse is 22 million years old, and even if this one directly gave rise to this second one, we are only seeing these two points. The gradual change in the middle is missing from our fossil record, so we can easily say that these are two different species. Exactly. When you have so much data, when you have so many species closely related to each other and close to each other in time, it becomes much harder to say where does the transition officially happen are the earliest yeah. Australopithecines, should we call them Australopithecus, or should we give them the name that they share with the older hominins that are very similar to them? Uh, mm-hmm. I mentioned before that the the youngest Australopith 
uh, uh, Australopithecus sediba. Some have suggested that it should be named Homo sediba because it's so similar to the Homo genus. I yeah. also read that some people have actually suggested that Homo habilis should be considered Australopithecus because <laughs> it's so ancestral, it's so archaic compared to other Homo species. And so yeah. trying to, you know, this is one of the reasons there's so much arguing over the naming of these groups is we we have so many points that our points are forming a spectrum. Yeah, and that's what I was about to compare it to was a spectrum. Mm -hmm. uh, I saw a, a, one of my the favorite things I ever did in physics was when we used a, a spectrometer to look at different sources of light and see, you know, what colors and what bars of light got separated mm -hmm. out you know it's really common thing you do in physics class but the coolest thing you can do is if you look at a artificial white light you know like one in your room yeah just in you know, any white light bulb it will have very clear bars of roy g biv right 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 it's, it's emitting light at points along the spectrum it, you see each bar specifically of red you know uh you know uh you know red blue green, so on and so mm -hmm. forth. If you look at the sun with it, you know, or, or sunlight with it, you will see the actual full spectrum. Interesting. Where red bleeds into orange, and orange bleeds into yellow, mm -hmm. which bleeds into green, bleeding into blue, and indigo and violet. You know, each one connects with the next one, slowly transitioning from one to the other. Yeah. And you could obviously pick the middle of each of those, and say, oh, Roy G. Biv. Right. But if you were asked to draw a line between the colors, separate. Right. Where does red, red from officially orange. become orange? Yeah, when is red finished and orange starts? Mm -hmm. All right. If you gave that process to a group full of people, they're all going to have slightly different positions. Yes. Uh, especially if your colors are not the same size. If you're <laughs> If one lasted longer than another. Yeah. You know. You now can't just say, well, I'm going to put it in the line in the middle between the two middle points because one may have lasted a lot longer or been much more diverse or whatever has you as we transition back into the species yes. part of the metaphor. And so there's all sorts of discussion about, right, Australopithecus, Anamensis, Afarensis, Africanus, Gari, Sediba, are these points along a transition or some of them branches off? When does this mm -hmm. one become this one? And the other thing that starts to happen is that a lot, and we'll see this a lot in the later hominins, a lot of them are so spread out over space, right? Different populations in different countries mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that that adds a whole other realm where we're trying to say, all right, here's a species that has been found in three countries and each population's a little different, just like we see in modern animals, right? That the northern yeah. reach, of, you know, white-tailed deer in the in Canada in the northern United States are different from white-tailed deer to, you know farther south mm -hmm. at what point in that variation it, are those different subspecies are those different species that are just still mm -hmm. interbreeding a little bit because that's another thing that happens is species spread out and different populations will gradually become more and more different until perhaps they become separated but at what point they officially become different species is arbitrary right yeah when is different different enough yes and so that's something we're going to see a lot more as we continue this discussion is is this one species or is this four species because <laughs> we've got so much of it and i think the other thing that really comes up in in the study one of the other reasons we argue so much about hominins is because mm -hmm. Right, when you study, and this is something we've talked about since episode one, when you study ancient creatures, you learn about them by comparing them to modern creatures. Yes. And there is no modern species whose anatomy we know better than ourselves. It's, it's, we are literally the only group of animals you can study voluntarily without having to strap them down or <laughs> sedate them somehow. <laughs> or, yeah. Like, we are the only ones that you can go up to and go, hey, could I please study you? Uh, <laughs> yes, would you, could you sign this release form and I will yeah. study you? So yeah. we know our genetics literally 
Inside and Out. We were the first genome to, you know, that we, we focused on sequencing yeah. and we know our biology. We know our structure. We can know our family history. We can know our regional history. Yep. You know, you can do it online for a, a, a moderate cost just to be like, hey, I want to know what my genetics are or I want to know where all my relatives are. So we know ourselves yeah. inside and out. And we've been studying our this skeletons for thousands of years, mm-hmm. which ev- it's, it's, a, it's a curse of, of data. Yes, it's it's like it, it, I mean it's like being dropped into you know a full library and just being told all right you know go learn the specifics of one subject uh, you have all information at your hands yes uh, well, the the analogy that it, it, it that comes to mind for me is asking humans to infer the skeletal structure and history and an anatomical history of other hominins is like mm. asking an expert in a field to review your book about that field. Yes, exactly. It's, it's like, hey, I wrote a book about the planets. Can I can I get Neil deGrasse Tyson to make some edits for me? It's like he's gonna make a lot of edits. <laughs> yeah, because <laughs> he because we have this knowledge, and it, again, this is where a lot of our arguing comes from. We have, and we suffer from an overabundance of information. It's it's one of those things where it's. It means that we're getting some incredibly acute answers, yes, like maddeningly detailed. But as we, as you said at the very beginning, for every bit of information raises more questions. It means that those details are things we can continue to debate or analyze. Indeed. And speaking of debate and analyze, the next step on the hominin and evolution family tree is the genus Homo. Which brings us into a realm of even more ridiculous details and arguments. Yep. But for that, dear listeners, we direct you to part two of this episode, where we complete our discussion of hominin evolution. Now, usually, the end of the episode would be the part where I would say things like reminding our listeners to follow us on Facebook and Twitter Mm -hmm. and email us at commonascentpodcast at gmail.com and leave us reviews and comments on iTunes or Podbean and check out our blog. And then I would remind everybody that we typically release new episodes every fortnight, so you can check out the next episode in two weeks. But not today. Not going to say any of that stuff. Nope, not any of that. We're not saying any of that stuff today. So I hope you remember (laughs) all of it from the last time I said it. Because this is such an interesting topic, because we are not fans of cliffhangers, and because we're a little bit crazy... (laughs) <laughs> we are going to record the second part of this discussion right now, and then we are going to release parts one and two of this episode together yes. on the interwebs so that you, dear listeners, do not have to wait. I call it the Netflix strategy. <laughs> We're releasing mm-hmm. them so that they're bingeable. Yep, absolutely. So at this point, we ask that you take the podcast out, flip it over to side B, <laughs> and continue the rest of the discussion there. You know what's funny about that joke? Is that we have listeners who don't? Who I know. Not that. <laughs> we're not old. I don't like. We're not very old, but that is a joke that does not translate necessarily to all of our listeners. Yep. Our friend Darwin does not understand that joke. No, no, probably has not had to do that. I had to do that every time I wanted to listen to the Lion King soundtrack yeah. when I would go to sleep. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> we had to do that with um, video games. It used to come in multiple discs. Like, yeah. my Treasure Island game was four discs, and I could only get the first three to work, which was uh, unendingly frustrating. Oh, yeah. that's No, we had, I had VHSs. Long movies were put on <laughs> VHSs with that a lot of the time. Uh, you used to hate cassette players that did not auto-flip. Yeah. That wouldn't just play both sides, just re- reverse it and play it over. So, the part where we start rambling about cassettes and VHS is, is the part where you know it's time to end the episode. Dear listeners, join us as soon as you want for the second part of our discussion on hominin evolution next time. Right now. On the Common Descent Podcast. Yeah. Bye. See you soon. Thanks for listening to the Common Descent Podcast. For more from us, you can follow us on the Common Descent Podcast Twitter account, Facebook page, or on our WordPress blog, where we post additional cool stuff for each episode. 
The song you're hearing is called On the Origin of Species by Protodome. You can find this and other video game remix music at ocremix.org. Thanks again for listening. We hope to see you next time.